Hi folks, it's good to be with you. Love to everybody out there. My website's jasonburnspreacher.com. You can get me on Facebook and Twitter. It's good to be with you. I want to talk about in this video uh, the debate that me and Mike uh, had it with Mansoor and a, and, a, and a nice gentleman called Abbas. I want to look at some certain issues concerning that debate. And the reason I'm doing this is because in the debate with them, although Abbas was very nice and Mansour was much more open to discussion, I, I, I stood in when, when he was discussing with two gentlemen, John and uh, Stefan, who were helping me that day. I stood in and listened to the discussion that, that Mansour was having with John and Mansour wouldn't let me talk. Uh, but then later on in the day, he seemed to have changed his tune and let me let me discuss. But it was only under very controlled environment, and what that meant is they were able to manipulate and control the discussion rather than have a fair one-on-one -on -one discussion or a, a fair discussion where it wasn't them in control, but we were both able of both teams were able to discuss and dialogue in a proper and fair way. Because they were always in control of that discussion. And because of that, certain things got shut down what I wanted to present. So, first of all, uh, I want to pick up on uh, uh, Abbas and Mansour, who said that um, I asked them to give me the chain of narration for the revelation of the Quran that was written down on stick stones and bones. Um, they denied, they said, no, this is not an argument because you've not provided ev any evidence. And I said to them, well, Adan, who's a historian and on their side, Muslim historian, uh, he confirmed that this was correct. So these guys didn't want to get into that. They didn't want to give any arguments or evidence for that position um, and there is a, a Muslim scholar uh, called Salid who wrote a PhD on the history of Quran in that PhD right at the beginning he notes about the, the revelations that was given on sticks, stones and bones so there's a PhD reference um, so they didn't deal with that and, and you found all the time that they were just homing in on Christianity, but when you ask them a question, they just wouldn't deal with it. They wouldn't even pick it up. They just said, oh, you haven't provided any detail or reference, so it's not really an argument, which which I think was a bit disingenuous, really. I think they were being, to be honest, I do think they were being dishonest, really. Um, Abbas' argument uh, all through the day was, if the Quran had been corrupted, you could not uh, explain why all Muslims everywhere can recite the Quran exactly. And my argument was that that's just a myth. There's no objective evidence for that. Now, he quoted uh, a German woman scholar. Uh, he said of an 800-page book. He never named the book. He never named the page number. And I think it was uh, Professor Nguyen, and he said that she said that the Quran is one. Now that was a bla that was just blatantly uh, twisting her scholarship. Uh, she's one of the peop scholars that's been behind the Quranopia, which is a massive encyclopedia uh, and reference work where the cataloging uh, ancient literature at the time of the Quran. To see what lies behind the Quran, what other uh, words, literature, and cultures have been brought into the Quran. So I know that for a fact. I've read articles of hers. Uh, you can go on Cornopia, uh, Caranopia, uh, to find out uh, who started it, why they started it. So Abbas was misrepresenting uh, this professor's scholarship. Now I was not able to get that in when he mentioned this scholar. I was cut off. At various points was not able to give a fuller explanation of the scholarship of this lady and yet he pretended to know this woman's scholarship and presented it in a wrong way 
And my main argument to Abbas, Abbas was saying that if you um, can go all around China anywhere and get people to recite the Quran, it would be exactly the same wherever. But my argument was this is mythological. You haven't got any objective studies for this, and which there aren't. And uh, so it's just a, a subjective opinion. But I was trying to argue and show right at the beginning of the of the history of the Quran there was massive corruption and I'm going to go into it. So first of all, uh, the, the Muslims said the Quran was passed on through uh, chain of narration, memorization. But we have Surah, uh, Surah Bakari, Volume 6, 61, 556, Surah Bakari, Volume 6, 61, 513, Sunnah Abduid, B3, uh, 1015. Sayyid Bukhari, Volume 6, 61, 514. Sayyid Bukhari, Volume 6, 61. Sunni al Timothy 3103. Sayyid Bukhari, Volume 6, 60. Sayyid Bukhari, Volume 6, 60, uh, 478. Sayyid Bukhari, Volume 4, 1799, 1802. Sayyid al Bukhari, 6, 61, 527. All these references show that Muhammad could not remember his own Quran. So this idea that the Quran has been saved by memorization is just it's just false because the prophet couldn't have even memorize their own words the next thing about this memory uh, about this it's the same all over there are different Qurans there are different Qurans. You have, for example, uh, the Wash Quran and the Hash Quran. And so there are textual differences. In the Wash Quran, in 2.259, it says, We shall raise up. In uh, the Wash Quran, in 2.258, because it's a different numbering, it says, We shall revive. In the Atai, in the um, Hash in the sorry in the Hash Quran it says I gave you 381 chapter 3 verse 81 in the Quran it says we give you in chapter 3 verse 80 it says he gives them in chapter 4 152 in the halves and we give them in chapter 4 151 in um, in the wash so this idea that the Quran is memorized and repeated exactly the same all over the world it's just nonsense it's just dishonest there are crans today that are different they're they're not the same words and i've just shown it here uh, so then we have certain questions that i asked i asked abbas people like uh, zayed uh, tabid uh, caliph al, al abu Bakr, uthman i asked when the Quran was compiled, did these companions have authority from Muhammad? And Abbas acknowledged they did not. So basically, you're saying that this Quran has been perfectly preserved word for word in manuscript form up to today because of oral tradition. But yet, the people who compiled the Quran never had any authority from Muhammad. So it was a human collection and humans make mistakes and humans fail so it's just disingenuous and anti-intellectual to believe that no human beings made mistakes in their copying So I'm just concentrating uh, on a bass at the moment, and then I'll come to to some of the things that Mike was getting onto. Sorry about this. We get there, we get there, don't worry, don't worry. So, in the discussion with Abbas, 
I provided also to show that the Quran was not perfect today a Muslim writer uh, called Layath al Shabi, a Muslim writer who has written and, and stated that there are different Qurans and acknowledges this. So I gave evidence from their own writers. Then I noted, then I noted to Abbas that and to Mansur that the top copy Mushaf has 22% of the Quran missing. Uh, the Sama RQ manuscript has 66% of the manuscript missing, and the Al Husseini Cairo manuscript has. Um, Sorry, no. The Paris Petropolitanus manuscript has only 74% of the Quran in it. And I've confirmed this with Islamic Awareness, which is a Muslim site, and also a more professional site of Corpun, uh, Corpus Quranicus. Now, I mentioned this to Mansour and Abbas. They never took or run with this or challenged it or debated it and basically this just destroys the idea that the Quran was passed on perfectly when your yeah, ancient Qurans they weren't the full Qurans in those ancient texts um, so and the problem with the Muslims uh, scholars and the Muslim debaters is they try to claim the high ground of oral tradition is oral tradition is going to be passed on but you got to look at the manuscripts and the manuscripts tell a different story for example if you look at Tabari one of the great Muslim scholars he acknowledges that there were textual variants but the way he deals with it he says there were seven ways of pronouncing you could say seven really seven different ways of textual variants So now, so we, so I was able to get into a bit more about the Quran uh, later on with Abbas, and I just wanna I mentioned about um, about to Abbas about Uthman. Uh, this is in the book Facing the Muslim Challenge, John Gilchrist. Here, he says Abdullah ibn Masood at first strongly resisted the order as I had copy had been standardized as an official text and it was used purely as a member of convenience being close at hand in Medina and not identified with any particular group of Muslims Abdullah complained that he had directly obtained 70 surahs from Muhammad while Zaid was still a young child why should he now forsake what he acquired Abin Abu Dawud. Kitab al Masaf, page 15. He also plainly stated that he preferred the Quran recitations of Muhammad himself to that of Zaid, implying that he did regard Zaid's codex as completely authentic, and adding that the people have been guilty of deceit in reading the Quran. He also plainly stated that he preferred the Quran, Quranic recitation of Muhammad himself, so that to that of Zaid implying that he did not regard sorry he did not regard he did not regard Zaid's codex as completely authentic so there were different codexes there were different Qurans early on and Uthman burned the Qurans and made one Quran and this is the kind of scholarship that I am not allowed to debate with Muslim scholars I'm not allowed to debate with Abbas or Mansur or Muhammad Hijab they will not let us get into the scholarship and, 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 and expose the Quran. And I could only mention this a little bit. And it was just dismissed out of the park. And 
no deep in-depth discussion was allowed by Abbas on this topic. And so the argument, you know, uh, an, another example is here, is uh, the stoning of adultery. Amr ibn al Khattab, one of the very closest companions of Companion, and his second successor taught plainly from the pulpit in Medina while he was caliph. That where his Surah 24 2 teaches the adulterer should be lashed with a hundred stripes, a verse of the Quran originally stipulated that many men and women who commit adultery were to be stoned to death. See that you, here's the quote, this is in uh, Malik page 352. See that you do not forget the verse about stoning and say, We do not find in the book of Allah, and the book of Allah, many pe may, may peace be upon him, had ordered stoning, and we too have done so after him. By the Lord who holds possession of my life, if people should not accuse me of adding to the book of Allah, I would have had this transcribed therein, the adult men and women who commit adultery, stone them. And I could go into a lot a lot more textual variants, verses that have been lost in the Quran, and a very dodgy history in the early Quran. But Mansur and Abbas would not would not real would were not willing to engage in a critical analysis of the textual criticism of the Quran. So what happened is we got into more of a conversation from where Mike uh, had stated about the age from the gap of the time gap between uh, the Quran uh, from the New Testament to the Quran. So you have the New Testament and then you have the Quran 600 years later. And Mike made the point, I wasn't there at the time, but I gather he made the point that the Quran came 600 years after, so which are you going to take notes of? And Mansur and Abbas, Abbas made the point, well, uh, Jesus came after the, the, the Old Testament, but it doesn't impinge upon Jesus. Now, there was a long discussion about the difference between the New Testament and Old Testament, but I, I thought I, I wasn't allowed at that time it was early on in the discussion to give my opinion. If I would have been able to give my opinion, I would have stated that there is a big difference between the Quran coming 600 years after um, the Bible because there's certain historical information about Jesus that is stated in the New Testament, such as his death, for example, which is contradicted by the Quran. So... The earlier source, the earlier source, if it's claiming to be eyewitnesses, and if there's evidence backing it up, it's going to be much more reliable than a source that doesn't seem to have any evidence and doesn't seem to have anything outside source backing it up on the crucifixion of Jesus. So we have, uh, we have uh, Suetonius, one forty A.D. Tatitus 120 AD, uh, Marisar Brapian, Lucian of Samosa, and Celsus. We have the Tolman, we have Josephus, etc. And all these sources show the historical truth that Christ died, and they're early sources compared to the Quran. So the age gap between the New Testament and the Quran is important and does lay some difficulty upon the Quran and a greater burden of proof on the Quran if it's making a claim that Jesus didn't die. Now this was not touched upon in the discussion. I wasn't allowed to get in, but that's the point that I would have made in that discussion, that it's a red herring where they were debating and discussing. This is the main issue, the historical veracity of the New Testament as opposed to the uh, historical paucity and downright lies of the Quran. The next stage where I was allowed to get in was to talk about um, the issue of the Gnostic Gospels and that is where I actually had done quite a lot of study over the last couple of days and I've done much study um, I've done quite a lot of study on this. 
Um, I've done quite a lot of study on this. Sorry about this. I've done quite a lot of study on the Gnostic Gospels. And I'm just getting my, my uh, sources ready. Now. Looking for my book. I've got a little book. So, for, well, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit till I find. Um, so, Mansour was arguing that basically he was saying that this her the heresies of Gnostic Gospels were wide, far and wide. So, how can it be that they're all wrong? And he, he was painted a picture that. Heresy was just as widespread, the Gnostic Gospels were just as widespread, and so therefore have a, a just as much important claim to be authentic than, say, the four Gospels. So I did make the point of the Gospel of Thomas, which I did make this point. These are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke and Didymus, Judas. Thomas wrote and he said, Whoever finds the explanation of these words will not taste death. Jesus said, Let him who seeks not seek seeking unto he find and when he finds he will be troubled when he has been troubled he will marvel and when he reign over all jesus said if those who lead you astray you see the kingdom is in heaven then the birds of the the heaven will precede you and if they say to you it is the sea then the fish will proceed but the kingdom is with you and it is without you if you will know yourselves then you will be known and you will know that you are the sons of the living father but if you do not know yourselves then you are in poverty, and you are in poverty. Jesus said, the man, the man old in days will not hesitate to ask a little child of seven days about the place of life, etc. And basically, if you read the Gospel of Philip, you read the Gospel of Thomas, and many of these Gospels, they kind of a lot of them don't make sense. They make statements like, uh, you have to become a man has to become a woman to get saved etc or a woman has to become a man to get saved sorry so they have te esoteric teachings that no Muslim or Christian would really agree with such as that secondly the Gnostic Gospels quote the four Gospels thirdly the manuscripts that we have there's only a few manuscripts of the Gnostic Gospels we have hundreds of, gos hundreds of the Gospels showing you that the Gospels are widespread uh, thirdly, the manuscript tradition of the early Gospels is, is widespread in origin, Tertullian, uh, Irenaeus, Polycarp, Ignatius, widespread across the ancient world, which shows you that they were the most accepted. Uh, the next thing is the Gnostic Gospels can be split up into three parts. There's philosophy, like Stoicism in some Gnostic Gospels, mysticism, like from the Middle East, or... Uh, on the Near East and then there's like uh, kind of ethical teachings so those are the three areas nothing detailed about the historical Jesus which is another area the Gospels four Gospels are very detailed in their understanding of the archaeology of Jerusalem and Palestine of that time whereas the agnostic Gospels the Gnostic Gospels don't really understand what the place is like in Jerusalem or match the archaeology that we found there. So obviously, then the, from a later date, uh, Mansour stressed that well, the, they were quite well used because uh, Irenaeus wrote big tombs against them, and that's quite true. But that's not the. But that doesn't necessarily. That does not make the point that the Gnostic Gospels were widespread and accepted as much as the four Gospels that he could not prove and he should concede that I, I gave ample evidence to show that that wasn't the case so i'm just seeing if i've got um, sorry about this
you're very patient so ah here it is so then we uh, then I think Manso touched upon the the point that in uh, in Luke uh, the first verses of Luke Manso made the point and you can go and find this discussion that we had uh, to check up whether what I'm saying is correct or not correct but Manso then went on to talk about Luke words about eyewitnesses so he said for as much as many are taken in hand to set forth an order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed even as they delivered them unto us uh, from the former beginning and were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word so Mansur made the point that um, that there were lots of other people who had written biographies of Jesus and he quotes this passage but I said that there was a big difference here so he was implying that uh, there were lots of writings right at the beginning but I, I had to stress that there was a difference between what Luke was saying as opposed to the Gnostic Gospels I said the Greek word eyewitness comes from the historian Polybius Polybius was a 200 century BC historian and he used the word eyewitness and it's the same word that Luke is using which shows you that to be a good writer Polybius said use uh, eyewitness account and you have Plutarch the historian who, who wrote in 70 AD who said uh, have eyewitness material uh, if you're going to write so the Gospels are based on eyewitness material you can see the detail of the times the detail of how they understood the area of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas of Jerusalem where the Gnostic Gospels don't have that detail and I said like the Gospels mention Jerusalem 70 times only a handful of times does the Gnostic Gospel mention Jerusalem they don't have that detail so I, I countered uh, Mansur on this issue um, I could have got I had I actually had here a notebook more on this issue of the authenticity of the Gospels and why they're important as opposed to the Gnostic Gospels but uh, I wasn't allowed to get into that uh, and I could have got into that which is a shame uh, the next issue that we discussed which was very very difficult because it's a very complex subject and they hammered it and hammered it and hammered it because it kind of looks good to the Muslim uh, who, who are listening my, my proving about the Quran later on uh, was a later discussion with Abbas so we had the discussion early on in Mansur and uh, Abbas concerning the different the, the difference in age from the New Testament to the Quran then we had that went on for about 20 minutes I wasn't get able to get much in there then we had uh, about a 15 20 minute discussion on the Gnostic Gospels I was able to get a lot of information in there and then for the rest of it for the first half and the second half the first half was with Mansur and Abbas and then Abbas on his own, I was we was able to talk about textual criticism. But the first half with Mansur and Abbas, and the latter bit of the video, the video discussion, uh, was primarily on the New Testament, and the textual criticism of the New Testament. And it was very difficult to deal with that, because they were hammering it on the questions. It was a complex um, discussion. And basically they were saying that, look, you've got the NIV, you've got these other translations, how come that you have so many different versions and how come you have the NIV and why is the NIV not accepting what I'm saying? 
And what I was saying, and they were saying, have you got the pure word of God? And I was saying, we have the pure word of God in all the manuscripts. So they said, well, is the pure word of God in that Bible, King James or NIV? And I said, they're not perfect. They're only what, what people have pulled together from the manuscripts. But we have the word of God in all the manuscripts. So they said, well, is, is, um, have people been fooled then? And... I had to stress two points. One is what the Westminster Confession says about the Bible.